You were telling us about the football series and how that was an extremely important work for you because um, you had seen this terrible video of the Taliban. So if you just wanted to continue with that. Yeah, so uh, what I, uh, uh, I was um, wondering uh, about, you know, the extremist forces taking control of um, our lives and everything was affected, badly affected. Um, so um, I, I just wanted to understand, you know, how people can actually take a lot of pleasure in violence, uh, really brute violence. So I asked uh, some of my close friends, my uh, family members, to allow me to photograph their body parts. Mm -hmm. And I printed it together, uh, their skins and hair and fingers, limbs. And um, so I took that print on synthetic leather to Salcourt in a um, uh, football factory. And I asked them that if they could make footballs for me. and. Then I actually, you know, that was part of the whole project that I did not want to design that, okay, in, in how the cutting is going to take place and how the stitching is going to take place. Because, you know, the whole idea was about when you see on media, the body parts and after bomb blast, you know, the tissues and blood and it's splattered uh, limbs and, you know, um, you don't really can't make sense of what is happening. Mm. Whose limb is there? Whose finger is that? You know, whose skin, tissue, cell, blood. So I I wanted them to cut it. You know, all those body parts which I printed, I wanted them to cut it themselves and see how they want to stitch a football according to their aesthetics. Oh, how interesting. So uh, so I left the whole leather with them. I took photographs while they were cutting it. And uh, so I went back, took the footballs. They were fabulous. Uh, I mean, because there was this whole idea of, you know, this. Uh, so I was not expecting it was going to be exactly like that because I left it on their whim. And mm. uh, so they were really nice to me, you know. And when I displayed them on the floor I, in Karachi, they, they were people I thought that I asked them if they want to play, they can kick the football. And people find it, found it very hard to kick those football because they were actually footballs. But there was a lot of skin, you know, they could see the skin. And so for me, you know, the whole discussion started, you know, that can you kick a football, which is actually a football, but it resembles, you know, uh, skin or it resembles there was like some portions of finger some nail polish was also on those, those nails some in some points so this whole and that debate makes, of violence and yeah no and that also sort of makes it seem so strange exactly what you were saying that the taliban who published the video were perfectly perhaps maybe not perfectly comfortable but they were able to kick around people's heads Whereas other people found just the idea of the football with the skin imprint on it so difficult to deal with. Yeah, or maybe, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm still uh, not able to make a very conclusive statement because then after that, I did another show, which was about um, facing someone who has been killed uh, because the person was a Shia doctor. And mm. so I traced on that particular day, uh, his last five, 10 minutes, you know, the path from the house to the point where uh, the, the doctor was shot. And uh, so I did the whole show on that, trying to understand uh, what happened, what must have happened at that point. And the title of the show was Usro's Ki Adhuri Kahani, because I was trying to understand what must have happened but we would never understand, we would never fully grasp what actually happened, what was in his mind, how the killers came, you know. So I, uh, I am now developing this whole uh, theory of um, the mourning and trauma and the violence. And I do feel that, you know, in, in my city, especially Lahore, um, there are so many streets, areas where there are so many stories of violence. And mm. these are uh, stories to be unfold 
and to understand because uh, since migration, since partition, uh, we have been living uh, in a city with ghosts or stories of, you know, people left their houses, people were killed, people came here with nothing, uh, half of their families gone. So, I mean, we have a lot of trauma and we don't talk about it. We don't address it. So I think it's time that, and I see a lot of artists now working on these kind of issues because they are there, it's our reality. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's true. The ghosts of our past almost in the people <laughs> who may have, yeah, it's true, the people who may have walked the streets before us. And I know, Farida, you've spoken about a performance, well, not a performance piece that you've done, actually, a sort of a public happening that you did, which was a walk through Lahore and traveling different routes. And I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about that, because I found that particularly fascinating, the way that you explore different parts of the city and sort of the impetus behind it. Yes, a story of a city. Um, yeah, I, I think it is one of my most important work because um, I was in the middle of my PhD and uh, when I completed this work, I could see my research and my art was just now at the point where they could merge happily and could come out as a one joint piece. Uh, what I did was I selected a number of pathways in the city where which I have been taking or I used to take regularly or sometimes I enjoyed it. Uh, so, um, and there were different segments I, and I stitched them together to make a 70 feet long lenticular piece. Um, I, I became like... Um, the storyteller, and I asked my husband Rahim and my uh, friend, artist friend Hassan Mustaba, who was also my student, uh, to document me while I'm uh, walking. So, so they had to walk uh, on the other side of the road while I'm walking, and I was aware that I'm being photographed. It was a performance, so it is not as I I would not claim that I didn't know about uh, it, and I'm you know. So everything which I was doing was something that I am being framed each and every step. So, so it means that I'm telling a story through my walking. So in that sense, I would say it's a performance. And uh, so whoever I'm passing by, what I'm looking, what I'm passing through, everything was being documented in certain ways so that you know it becomes a story of the city. And it had so many layers, like uh, a wall with graffiti prints, marks, uh, with hate statements, with love statements, um, people, you know, young boy, 12 year old, 13 year old girl, uh, holding hands, walking in front of me, police, guards, <laughs> uh, people who are just looking at me as because I'm a woman, you know, so everything was recorded and that was the whole point, you know, to have those multiple layers, you know, to expose them, to bring them together, you know, how uh, how I wanted to see the city. I didn't want to see Lahore as just the cultural side, just the religious side, just, you know, just a certain part of the Lahore. No, it was me who is going to tell everyone how I see the complexity in it. And I would say that complexity in the end was very interesting where I end the walk. It was uh, on the wall of Jane Banda, which is no more there. And there are so many walls which are no more there because uh, then after that, there was uh, this um, law uh, by the local government to vault wash all the walls so people could not do the graffiti. So whatever I recorded, in that work were, I think, the last pieces of some of the hate speeches. Oh, so it was because of those hate speeches that the government decided to just... Right, but it doesn't right. mean that that sentiment was also whitewashed. It, the sentiments were there, it's just that they, you don't see it. So in the, in the end of the wall um, where I was walking, there were uh, some extremist um, band, extremist group had their flag painted and on top of that flag, uh, someone just pasted those, uh, you know, German health centers uh, advertisements. And, mm -hmm. you know, German health centers is a 
known for male uh, sexual issues, uh, things related to those. So anyone who has problems who can with the masculinity or sexuality, so can go to those um, local uh, centers, health centers, and get you know a treatment. So these are the okay. advertisements. So I thought, perfect, you know, you have this band, religious band uh, organizations flag, and then the, on top of it, there is this masculinity posters. <laughs> so this is what exactly Lahore is about. It's so complex. It is not something, you know, just uh, one. So many different you themes. Frame it yeah. into one category. Yeah. And how did you feel being photographed by, I mean, you knew they were there, of course, but did you ever find it a little alarming? And did you kind of adapt your behavior because you knew you were constantly being photographed? But Was it know, very strange uh, for you, you to walking, be the subject? Uh, if you are a woman and you are walking, are you naturally walking or are you conscious it's on true. the street? Yeah, that's very true. We are performing. Yeah, we are performing. I mean, always. I, I always ask this question in my class uh, that uh, who can say that you are a flaneur? Mm -hmm. and you know can roam in the city aimlessly so the boys always raise their hands but the girls they, they don't understand the meaning of aimless walk in the city because mm -hmm. it never happens so um, so in that sense yes i would say that it is always a constructed walk that's very true actually and now I wanted to ask you also about the Avami Art Collective, because that's also another very um, public facing or I mean, an organization that, or, or collective, a group of artists who are basically creating artwork for the public. Can you tell me a little bit about how this started and how it fits in with your individual practice as well because of course your work as we've spoken about is very much about public projects learning from the community kind of having a lot of research done as well but how was it adapting to the viewpoints of other artists as well and how, how did it come about um before uh, Avami Art Collective was formed, um, uh, me and um, Rahim, my husband, and another friend, Raza, we were involved in initiating a small group, uh, which mm -hmm. was called uh, Reclaim Sada Lahore. Mm -hmm. And we started this group after APS, uh, when it happened, uh, because we were always concerned about, you know, uh, the extremist forces taking over con control of the city and how people are so threatened and insecure in the public areas and public places. So we really wanted to bring uh, back certain kind of, you know, uh, the tolerance, the coexistence, and it is okay to be different and it is okay to not agree with others' uh, point mm -hmm. of view, but, you know, to be able to live together with difference is something that we uh, were wanting to, you know, uh, disseminate. So we were trying to do some kind of activism through going to markets, talking to people on in the parks, uh, doing conducting art workshops, uh, kind of stuff. So some of these artists who became my friends later on, and um, they they saw our presence on Facebook, and they joined. Uh, they 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 showed their interest in coming and joining us, and. Then we one day sat down and said, okay, what exactly we want to do? So all of them, like um, uh, Mohsen Shafi, Sahar Jalil, Naira Mushtaq, Amara, Samra, um, so um, Rabia, Maria. So they all were people who uh, wanted to do something large scale in the public, mm. outside the white view, but uh, not... Um, uh, just for themselves. It, so the binding force was like, you know, to make a dent and to make a critique of what's happening around us. So uh, I think that was very interesting thing that, you know, that we were not friends, but uh, the ideology of working in the city space together was the binding force. And I think that's why we stayed together. It was more than the personal uh, uh, stuff and uh, that's why we could also um, 
do those projects because uh, we had to let go of our um, egos that you know, who's, who's are, who is going to be the main person who is going to be the you know uh, whose idea is going to be recognized so in the end no, no one's idea was like the one idea or the title we don't even remember who started what because everything is debated in the group it's very democratic in that sense mm-hmm. you know you have to uh, really fight your ideas and um, you have to justify why you want to do that and so, this was also before the beginning of the biennale is that obviously then happened in lahore and karachi and i think that this was perhaps you were one of the very few groups that was doing such public open practices what were some of the projects that you took on would you mind talking about them i mean i know the obviously the well i will let you speak so <laughs> um there were some very uh, some small uh, initiatives but uh, the major ones were two uh, one was in lawrence garden hum jo tareek rangon mein mare gaye um so it was a celebration or a memorial of uh, people who died in the name of ideology in the last 30 years so we took uh, the time frame at the end of the zal zal hak period and looking at the whole data um it was a very very uh, re- researched project where we collected data from different uh, archives and the newspapers so every year we collected uh, the a number of um, incidents bomb blastings and killings you know which happened whether a person was in the name of blasphemy or shia mm-hmm. or religious or uh, ethnic or you know whatever grounds so we collected it and it was huge it was so huge that we did not have the space in the lawrence garden to to make a circle full circle for each year so what we did that we had those years um but we selected incidents like there were so many mm-hmm. incidents that we had to let go of because That's they were so horrifying yes it is really very horrifying and you could actually see that there were some uh, years there there is lot of uh, 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 numbers and there were some years there were few so mm. but we had to uh, select and so we selected this circular form of uh, pathway uh, it was all white because the um, uh, norris garden was all green so we yes. thought it was the pakistani flag and uh, so the white is the one which is you know in the the peaceful and um, also the white for the minorities so it was in the center and it is the one which is threatened but the, mm-hmm. and you call it minority by minority in the real sense of minority in other sense like intellectual people are also the minorities it's true so um and then the walk ended into a, the inner circle where there were lots of you know um agarbatti you know the essence what mm. you call it um, those sticks um as yeah um, incense yeah, uh, the incense yeah so uh, so you the moment you enter entered at that time you know the main gates of lawrence you could feel that you have entered a shrine yes. and there were so many people who were moved you know the normal people who were regularly coming to lawrence garden for their evening walks or morning walks or, So, so these those are the people we were really interested to communicate our work with, and we have seen so many interesting moments. People have, you know, there are people who would just cry while walking through those um, yeah. buntings under those buntings and walking, looking at them, and they would not talk to us that why they are crying. Mm. They were just crying. There was a person who would come every day, and they would bring their own incense sticks. to wow. burn it was it became like a shrine to them and we did not have the heart to ask them that why you are doing because that exactly what we were doing you know to evoke those emotional responses but i was thinking that there must be something happened to uh, that of person course, you know yeah. so so in that sense it was able this project was able to penetrate people's memories so it was um, going down that memory lane and the other project which was a um, little bit opposite to that because this is very melancholic this mm. whole piece and the other piece was um, also about nostalgia memory of um, the sun 
but uh, it was in a very very celebratory way and um, you know the basant and all the politics around it uh, that you know whether it is a peace uh, festival which you should have in lahore in pakistan or not because it doesn't belong here it's not part of our heritage because and basant know. just to give everybody an idea is the festival celebrating spring that would happen in lahore for many many i mean centuries i would imagine and where kites were flown as well amid, mm. amidst a lot of cultural festivities of the city it was yeah. basically a way of celebrating the beginning of the spring and as children we used to all go to lahore my siblings and i with our parents we used to clamber up to the rooftops of various cousins homes and all take part in the kite flying so you had lovely kites decorating the skies of lahore and unfortunately even farid obviously knows as much better than i do but they ended up canceling the festival because of various allegations about safety so mm. farid and now why don't you tell us what the avami art collective um how they commemorated the sun uh yeah i think if they banned it for, and it's been more than 10 years now uh yeah. since the it's since it's banned and uh, there is a lot of uh, younger generation who has never experienced the beauty of it and you know so many i know there are so many people who died because of the string but you know mm. this is something like it it's bad on the on the government you know why can't they just control it and regulate it why you have to ban everything because uh, you see it was the same kind of a- approach when you have dengue so you uh, don't control the mosquito but you close the schools yeah so it was the same kind of you know mentality that um, you uh, let pe- let uh, the terrorist come but you close down the school then in 2009 this was mm. what happened for 3 months or 2 months the schools were closed shut down so um, so i mean the regulation is very important and it it's writ of the state has to be there you know they can easily manage it they can understand you know they know the system they know the whole fabric of the city that where and what kind of uh, string is being used they can have one day holiday where they ban you know every day you have a naka you know uh, of police mm-hmm. and people are not allowed to go through certain areas with cars or uh, so i mean they can have a, a motorcycle free day one day you know they can allocate of an course area because there, yeah. because what was things. happening no just to give back on what was happening was that many of the kite strings were being um the people were adding to them with glass or lead or poisonous materials yeah, just to yeah. make them stronger so when the kite strings would swing through the streets they would often hit um or injure motorcyclists and children would be injured while they were trying to cut other people's kites down because and kite there were was a lot of people who died because of that yes. and i i i think it's pretty terrible because yeah because you this is the last thing you want you know the the fun of one person is the death of another i mean of this is course. something that's not acceptable but uh, it reflects more on you know the naivety or um, mismanagement rather than you know um, the game itself know, it's true but so how did you uh, and um, the rest of the avami art collective team how did you pay homage to the festival and also to the old city because from what i remember um it was not just about basant there was also very much about how the fabric of the old city was being transformed yeah. so it'd be great to hear from you about that yeah because you know during basant a huge community of lahore is involved uh, and their livelihood was dependent on it not from the making part uh, and selling but also you know the food industry Yes. so people would rent out their rooftops and they would have parties um family would gather at friends or families you know someone in the old city and so there was a lot of hangama and fun kind of um, time uh, for one day and night uh, usually the second week of february and um um i would say that it it was a very secular kind of you know a non religious kind of festival of its kind of major one where where all sections all classes would join together you know uh, and gender 
so it, 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 it was very very democratic in many ways mm. and uh, to not have that anymore means that you know what we are having in the city is just food uh kind of yes we don't have theater we don't have uh, in that sense cinema we don't have uh, um, music performances anymore uh, in the stadiums like sufi music there used to be sufi music festival there used to be so many things no we don't have any of these anymore and people just go out like where do they go you know all those young people they have nothing but to just go and eat and the food is becoming very expensive uh, mm. so people can't afford so it is very very frustrating you know that uh, people uh, i mean we have been um, devoid of our heritage and it is awami felt that it was something very systematic because um, lahore was very famous culturally and um, to have metro going through that you know passing through shalimar gardens uh, yeah. gpo and Sha- um, choburji all of these places you know without thinking you know with, with such insensitivity to have your train the the fastest train you know with speed going through that area is going to have long lasting impact on those heritage buildings mm. and also the community uh, which was forced to leave their houses you know from mcclough road and uh, near uh, gpo behind gpo and in anarkali you know the bengali house and um, the build, bengali building so uh, all those places had to be eradicated um, they raised uh, people just left those and uh, they were not compensated properly so mm-hmm. it was a very very um, hard blow to the hori people and the community uh so people were reacting the hori people were reacting to it they went to court against it and uh, they were lot against this action. orange train line that they were yes. building through the city so i think so these two things were together and we thought uh, might as well join the together join the bandwagon the <laughs> yes and uh, the the orange color came from this orange train so we had this orange string of light which was going through like electric electric speed <laughs> so it was just uh, you know literally we were talking about that so what we did uh, we went to taksali gate and uh, starting introducing ourselves to the community we became friends and uh, so they allowed us to use their rooftops uh, rooftops and um, the community was involved in many ways like they had to be not only giving permission but also they were the one who were going to pay for the electric bill okay <laughs> electricity bill so uh, so in that sense it was participatory that they had to have their we had to have their consent because we said we don't we are not going to give you money uh, mm. for using your space so it is voluntary and you have to understand why we are doing it and they all understood it so they allowed and they were too happy they joined hands with us um they they some of the i will talk about that later you know how we created those designs but um, uh, this idea that we are going to leave the lights with them and it will be mm. there forever uh, and they will have uh, they will have to pay for the electricity or something that we felt okay now we are joining hands with the community for the first time and, and then the some of them because in taksali they are from you know the dance community from choreography from music and some of them who were in the choreography field they join uh, they were working with us as you know helpers oh, and brilliant. there were some of the areas on the you know roofs uh, which were like um, very uh, uh, complicated to climb hmm. so he said to me that okay why don't you stand here and let us go there and we understand what you want so like i said about the football so we had to say okay we trust you because you also are you know people who understand this area more than us they lift so, through all of okay, this so okay we throw the strings at you and you do whatever you want to do yeah. and you know in the end we all decided together that in the end the best 
cluster of the lights was the one which was designed by them. Wow. It was so poetic that uh, even um, uh, I remember uh, Takhar Dadi was visiting and he thought, oh, it's so poetic, it's so beautiful. And I told him that it was done by a choreographer and he said it makes sense. <laughs> because you know, choreographer knows the space and he knows the movement and he really understands how things are moving in the space. So and also uh, it's their space. They're yeah. the ones who like, they're the ones who live there. And tell me how did other because you had said earlier that you could only really see it from the rooftops when you went up. Yeah, yeah. You could yeah. really see the glowing orange lights everywhere. Um, was it visited quite a lot by people? Do you know? Yeah, yeah, we, we really worked hard. We developed maps, we developed, you know, oh, portions where they could climb. So people, uh, people who were visiting, they had to, you know, there were telephone numbers of the community members who, who will be the guides and who will let them, you know, go through those areas. So they had to interact with the people, you know, it is not that, okay, the art, artists are there and they are, mm -hmm visitors who are in, encroaching that space. So no, the local community was owning the whole project. So that's great. So, so they opened their homes, their houses to them, their doors, and they would let them go climb up five floors or seven floors. So the idea was to, you know, uh, to experience something which was on the rooftop. So it is not visible from the street. Some portions, yes, but not the whole thing. And, um, the sun used to take place on the rooftop. The light was always on the roof when the sun was exactly. not on the street. So it was in that sense was commemoration of that moment, you know, when uh, there was life on the roof. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we really enjoyed um, working in that one month period there because people were so close. We understood the city from a very different angle. Like uh, uh, when we asked, uh, permission from one person, you know, owner of the house. And when we climbed five stairs and decided, oh, but we want to extend the light to two more, you know, houses because the design says so. And no one had the himmat, you know, the, the strength to go down and then ask another oh, house. Do it so again. Just, yes. So we would just jump the roof to the other house and would start doing it or, uh, Someone will That's come very up. brave of you because they're not that close. <laughs> Gaps some of them that. are like very close, some of okay. them are not. So, <laughs> so, uh, so the owners would come up and they say, what are you doing on our rooftops? And we would just say, oh, hello, we are here and we are doing this and your neighbors have allowed it. So would, do you mind if I, we also do it on your rooftop? And after 30 seconds or 40 seconds, they would say yes. <laughs> oh, great. But, but you know this idea that can you imagine living in defense or Gulberg or um, even Shah, Shah Jamal or Shah Chadman areas in Lahore that someone is on your roof you suddenly find someone on your rooftop and <laughs> they're, they're, saying, neighbors. <laughs> uh, they're saying hello uh, we just want to have this light installation do you mind uh, this is something which you can't even imagine in the same city. That's but true. it's an entirely it, different culture. It is almost. a totally different experience. And we always think about it. But when we were working there and lived there, you know, almost like whole month, it was, I think I would say that the most fulfilling experience of my life. Wow. I can say that. I mean, so I, how, nothing, how long was it up to? That. I'm so happy to hear that. How long was it up for? Did they keep it on after month. the month? Okay. Yeah, it was whole month, and they left. They kept the um, light, and then okay. the lights were changed. Like they divided the lights, and <laughs> uh, so they decorated the fronts of their homes. Oh, sweet. Okay. But it had another life where we thought that it is their choice and how they wanted to do it. Exactly. The lights went on without, and the show must go on in a way. Yeah. So they made sure that that happened. But I wanted to ask you. So you've had a very sort of practical public involved sort of practice as well and yes your early years were very much about research and gaining data but tell me about the academic journey that you went upon the pursuing of the master's degree the pursuing of the PhD degree and then finally of course the teaching that you've been doing over the years 
<coughs> both at BNU and this new department at NCA. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> for my master's, um, you know, I, I really wanted to uh, do this theory program because uh, I was told by my great mentors and teachers, Nalsita uh, Ullah and Salima, that, you know, NCA needs people in theory and these True. people don't have many people. So so they are the one who was like forcing me, pushing me. And I was interested in reading books and researching. So I thought, okay, uh, let's try this on. So I got admission in Australia in UNSW and in art history program. So my um, uh, supervisor, she looked at my proposal and uh, my research when she was visiting in Lahore. So I she was conducting my uh, interview here. So I took okay. her around the city, the whole city and talked about, you know, different uh, things, uh, cultures, um, like gender problems, um, other identity issues. And she decided, she said, okay, you are not into hardcore art history thing, but you are more into, you know, visual theory, cultural mm -hmm. theory, art theory kind of stuff. So why don't you change your uh, proposal? And then for the first time, I realized that, you know, the kind of bullshit I was doing, you know, uh, in the There city, was a name the for it. <laughs> there is a field for it. Yeah. Because I was making a proposal for for modern art of Pakistan. And I, I was not too interested in that. So, <laughs> so it was something more contemporary. What I was interested in, you know, looking at the, giving meaning the interpretation of the visuals, material and images around me. So, so I think that was uh, how I started my journey in Australia. I got scholarship and it was a um, very interesting experience. I, uh, I learned so much. And then I published that into a book. My th uh, thesis was like the, about the figure. Uh, and it is all about my interaction with cinema, cinema holdings, popular culture, and looking at the notion of figure, you know. And this was something which I thought was some, uh, I really had to research. I could not do that through my art practice. I mean, of course, they are all linked, but um, it needed certain kind of uh, seriousness of a uh, scholar. Mm. Uh, so, so I did that. And after seven, eight years, I was thinking that I'm again ready for my PhD because I did a small film for BBC online uh, three minutes long. It was on Mujra dances, oh, and cool. uh, there was so much reaction uh, on the website. Uh, so the producer sent me those comments, and I was shocked to see that why people are reacting to that because it was uh, on Mujra, which they enjoy. But the frame was by a woman a director, mm. so, so they were reacting to why I am doing that. You know, this kind of research about men enjoying these dances. So, um, you know, what, you can understand what is happening to these days on social media. You know how they troll female anchors yes. and newscasters. So it was something like that, close to that. So that triggered more interest to me. And I was interested to see what exactly is masculinity about, you know, the male mm -hmm. desire and how they use new media, social media, and, you know, how they... Uh, use religion for their own sake and sometimes, you know, uh, very conveniently. Whenever they yeah, want yeah. to use, they use it and when they want to get rid of it, so they get rid of it. How they negotiate with state and how they have issues with um, women and female, female sexuality. So and how they feel it's completely right to criticize you for putting together this film and this research project when they're the ones who go to these mudras and enjoy it. Very interesting. Yeah, like my supervisor told me that, you know, there is a reason why men don't write about these things because they yeah. enjoy it. Uh, and, and I the, think they're, they're, <laughs> they often will become embarrassed of that enjoyment as well. They don't even admit if, if to you enjoying put a frame it. To it. Yes, if you yeah. put a frame that I'm thinking of, maybe I should put that into a book now. Definitely, and please. <laughs> Yes, and regarding my other interest, I am interested in looking at uh, the notion of art history because, you know, the way we were taught art history in NCA was very different. It was like Western art history, mm -hmm. Eastern art history. So I was very disturbed when I left 
uh, for Australia because I was in, exposed to so many ideas and theories and way of you know looking at things that uh, I thought we were living in archaic time. And we have to address the colonization of these fields and these areas, how they design um, through the museums and through certain kind of art practices that this is the only way of looking at art. So um, I was quite fortunate to be able to, uh, in culture studies department, to develop a team of uh, very talented uh, young faculty uh, who were as eager to start new bachelor's program as I was. So we all worked very hard together, uh, worked towards making a new program, first of its kind in Pakistan, the Bachelor's wow. in Art, uh, Cultural Studies. It has art history, it has museum studies, and it has culture studies, media, and you know, all that kind of stuff. It's so all important. All those subjects which we wanted to study when we were if we were in undergrad. So we, we developed it with that kind of passion that, you know, when mm. we are teaching, so it actually we are learning uh, those issues and ideas. That sounds fascinating. And how, so you have quite a large team working on it with you. How were you able to develop the curriculum? Uh, now we have, uh, we are in nine people who are uh, permanent, but uh, some of them joined late. It was uh, five or six uh, members who developed the whole program together. Um, but we also had um, very uh, some old um, faculty uh, who also taught us, like Madam Ali, who was a very strong force behind us, you know, that, you know, always bucking us, yes, bucking up. Okay. Yes, you can do it, do it, do it. That's great. And uh, we were supported a lot by the administration because they said, if you have, if you promise, like Geoffrey Sub told me that you promise that you have faculty, then I will support you. And the faculty was there. Yes, people, people were coming back in time, like right in time when I needed <laughs> them. Yes. They came back to help. But you know, you're right, because I'm co-teaching this class now, you know, for PNU's global um, program. And we're teaching a class about South Asian art history and South Asian art and what that means. And so many of our students said, you know, we really wanted to take this class because we don't know anything about South Asian modern and contemporary art or art history because we're not taught it. We're taught a very particular Western version of art history, which of course is very important as well. But yeah. it is equally, if not more important, to have courses like yours or programs like yours rather, departments like yours, which give that focus and that kind of um, attention to mm. Eastern ways of studying and the artists that are coming out, the practices that have been going on for generations. Yeah, because I mean, the end of, yeah. And yeah. at the end of the day, because, you know, globalization is not a new thing. There's been constant conversations yeah. between the yeah. East and the West and artists have been traveling back and forth. So, of yeah. course, there's been um, influences coming on both ends of the globe. And it's important and also, to recognize and also, that. You know, how, how you look at, you know, certain materials and certain uh, art, uh, art objects. Uh, that's also, you know, uh, the ways of seeing and ways of approaching art uh, and the methods. Uh, these are also very important issues in looking at art history. Like I did uh, last year, it was published. Uh, I co-authored an article with Salima Hashmi and uh, it was about, you know, contemporary art of Pakistan. But, you know, uh, it's a very interesting book which talks about, you know, ways of looking at art history uh, and um in, in South Asia, especially. So there are chapters from India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, mm -hmm. and one from Pakistan, it's me and Salima. And uh, in that we do talk about, you know, the frameworks, theoretical frameworks through which art has to be seen, you know. And um, so there are, there are very interesting moments in Pakistani art movement, you know, which are not part of um, our art history discourse uh, so you know it is very important to keep on developing these kind of discourses writing about it one of my uh, faculty uh, amna she's going to do her phd now from canada in art Wonderful. history 
and she is looking at you know certain movements where uh, certain kind of art of resistance uh, was the you know key um, key um, moment to design the future of pakistani art so you know in that sense there are so many researches which needs to be uh, done and but pe- now people are there and there are so many um so i i'm sure the art history of pakistan and the south asia is going to have different angle and uh, it's going to be much more interesting and enriching than just looking at through the western perspective of course now that artists and your own students and your own colleagues for example are sort of w- with this foundation they're now moving forward and looking back at it you're completely right now tell me do you um how do you merge your artistic practice and this research based practice do you see your work moving more towards a research based practice not academic i mean like research based art practice over time mm-hmm. has it always been like that and perhaps there was not the language to specify previously uh i think when i'm doing art i i think i do think that there is lot of research and i'm yeah. thinking and uh, so this kind of because i can't stop Uh, thinking in that particular way but when i'm doing art um it is i would say that it is something you know euphoric it is really like really ecstatic uh because some i do let my emotions uh, take over me you know over myself that if i i'm struck by a shadow like these days i'm taking a lot of photographs of shadows because i'm working towards my new uh, body of work so so i i mean so i don't have to give meaning to that shadow at this stage i mean yeah. i so i let it you know overcome me i let it take me you know so uh, where you need to go sense, exactly yeah. but you know when i make it so i then i do know that why i have been affected and these are the reasons and these are the mm. things these are the thoughts which were taking place for the last two years and now they are forming but suddenly it is not my thought it dictated the thought is happen- thought process is happening but it is um it is really uh, the material and the aesthetics of that thing which tells me that okay now this is how it should be so you know, yeah i wanted to ask this earlier and i didn't but about the materiality and the different mediums that you use because throughout your career you have worked with so many different materials and mediums from lenticular prints to the drawings that you do now you're doing photographs to your own performances how how do you feel they all come together and is there any particular project where you feel that they like these different methods of creating really came together nicely hmm um i think it's just the idea it's just the idea hmm. which creates the medium so it's not that i have to that have three lenticulars and one video and no yeah it is it is the kind of feeling you want to um express and then the mm-hmm. medium uh, you select because uh, which is you think is the best for for the expression you are looking at or looking for and you've always been very forward thinking like even the lenticular prints when you were doing them i mean you said yourself it was very expensive to create them at that time but you felt that they were the best way of expressing what you were trying to and really involve the the viewer in the mm. conversation yeah yeah uh, like uh, i think i had some very interesting very uh, very good teachers mm. and uh, their advice has really um, changed and uh, directed my thinking like uh, one when i was doing that walk piece so i really needed money because i was doing my phd and i was doing a lot of traveling back and forth every month i had to go to london because i couldn't afford to live in london but so for my meetings i had to go so it was i really needed money and um, i thought okay what if i do a show mm. 
and I knew people wanted something like, you know, close to LOC. So I thought, okay, I can make something like that and it will sell. Yeah. But what I really wanted to do desperately was uh, the walk. Mm. So I went to Mrs. Hashmi and I said, Mrs. Hashmi tells me, you know, uh, I have two ideas. One is something which is close to my heart. And the other is something which is going to sell. And I'm going to show it in your gallery. And you will be beneficiary of that sale. But she said, go for your heart. <laughs> She's absolutely right. And what a tragedy it would have been if you hadn't done that. Work. Yeah. So And you hadn't so, explored those yeah, parts of Lahore. Yeah. yeah. So I must say that, you know, um, I've been lucky to really receive such uh, great advices, you know, even in those times when I really desperately needed money. But I think you've also been really lucky and to act upon the advice. Often people are given advice and they think, no, we're going to do what we want to do. But you were lucky enough yeah. to understand that that advice was coming from a great place and it was important. Yeah, the choice and is always yours. Yeah. Exactly. And tell me, what is next for you? What are you thinking about? Oh, um, so you're working on your photography things. series right now. Once it all comes down, what are you thinking of? Yeah, you see, it's um, uh, the Corona period has really affected me. I mean, everyone, of course, but uh, I still can't understand it fully. And I'm, mm. I feel really um, clueless at what has happened. You know, this is something I could never experience. I've never, uh, I could understand uh, fully. So in that sense, I um, uh, uh, I really wanted to do something which express what I felt or experienced. Yeah. And also, I don't see the future world the way I used to see before Corona. So I'm not the same. I don't think that I'm the same person anymore. Uh, and I don't see there are many going to be many people who would be like that. So, you think that uh, this moment to quiet down in a sense has really transformed you? Yes, and I'm of course, I mean, the world, because you see, uh, it is not easy for months to not see people and interact, you know, and, you know, to see people and not touch them. This is something really, really uh, serious. Mm. Uh, and uh, of course, we have people are, human beings are very, you know, uh, resilient and they know how to survive so we have been lucky and we have been surviving that but you really first time I understood you know how it must have been like you know in world wars time yeah. and in you know, those depression moments and you know so what do you understand by the globalization this whole tourism this whole uh, flying and I mean the whole health issue what are the priorities you know so these are the things which which have been popping up constantly that where we are heading and the kind of people we are, the states and, you know, how they look at their uh, citizens and uh, global health is a new thing people are not talking about, you know, but before it was a global wealth, but where is that, you know, how it has helped us? I don't That's see true. that. That's very true, actually. So, and so now, that, actually, yeah, yeah. I think that uh, I must be thinking of doing something about, you know, the education part. Uh, maybe some kind of, uh, because uh, I was uh, looking at some articles who are talking about education in the times after Corona. And yeah. they are looking, the quality, uh, we have to really think of, you know, not the quantity and how, it has this, it has been going around but you know what kind of education we must be giving us you know the holistic and more humane and you know so so these are the things which i'm thinking about and i don't know i have many things to say that okay this will i do or this is something i want to do but definitely i want to do a show and i want to do a book you're very right though i think education is sometimes the only way where you can really enlighten people and point out what we've been doing wrong perhaps for a very long time and what things we may need to change. So I'm very excited about your show and your book. I think both will be very interesting. Have you started working on your book already? 
Oh, uh, this book is like my thesis, PhD thesis, which I'm thinking oh. of converting in. And the other book oh, brilliant. we are doing together, the whole Awami members is Awami book. Oh, amazing. So if we, if we manage to do it, so then we will be very lucky. Well, we'll have another conversation at that point about that book then <laughs> <laughs> and talk about it properly. But I wanted to ask if anybody had any questions for Farida. I haven't seen any come up besides this. Let me see. Farida, you can also scroll in case you see anything. Uh... There's one about Sai Twombly or Rashid Rana, but I think we can avoid that question. If you don't mind, uh, yeah. because both are very different artists and from very different genres, so it's difficult to compare artists in the best of times. So, so what was that? I, I missed it. I think. Oh, they, someone just asked Sai Twombly or Rashid Rana. Oh no, I mean mm. two. Two very different artists, so it's difficult I, yeah. to talk about them. I have so many other things to talk about, so ask me about them. Please, yes, exactly. <laughs> ask about Farida. Why about other artists? Don't waste your time. <laughs> Keep the conversation focused on her and her Yeah, practice. this is my moment. <laughs> exactly. It's an Insta moment. Instantly. It is indeed. No. But no, uh, let's wait for one more moment. Nobody's asking anything. Good God, what is wrong with you people? Someone's asking, when are we collaborating? Russell into a nail. Oh, is it Shira? Okay, so? I don't, I don't know. If, is this Shira? Well, for another jewelry piece. Again, <laughs> not so relevant. But Farida, I'm afraid the time is now unfortunately about to run out. Instagram gives you a warning. And after last time, I want to wrap up quickly. But thank yeah. you so much for everything, for doing this again and for this wonderful conversation. I really learned so much. And I think everybody who listened in did as well. So thank you so much. And thank you, everybody who was able to join us. This will go on our IGTV so everybody else can see it as well. Thank you, Zara. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. And thank you for talking to me again. It was fun. It was fun. Lots of love. And I'll see you properly in person soon, hopefully. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.